People with developmental disabilities no longer live in institutions or medically focused facilities. They are active and living full and rich lives as participating members of our community. For people who need assistance with medications, the role of dispensing medications no longer rests solely with nurses, but also with community support workers or families. Community-based teams are now in place to provide consultation and professional assistance. Physicians, nurses and pharmacists all have functions. In licensed facilities, licensing officers ensure compliance with the Community Care Facilities Act. The community living sector has shown that safe and effective medication procedures can be in place to support people within their homes, at work, and as active participants in their community. The proper administration of medications is an important health and safety concern for all individuals working with people with physical and developmental disabilities. Our goals in this video are to teach the correct procedures for medication administration, help you handle problems that may arise, look at the knowledge you need about medications you are administering, Look at the categories of medications commonly administered. Explain the role of the pharmacist in the healthcare team. Look at some common systems for dispensing medications. Explain the role of health services for community living. Explain the role of licensing in community care facilities. By the end of this video, you will understand the importance of knowing the following when administering medications. The drug name, the usual dosage, how the drug is to be administered and how often, special considerations for that particular drug, for example, taken with milk, any precautions. Now we're going to outline the steps for safe, efficient, and effective administration of medications. When administering medications, do only one person at a time. This will eliminate any mixing of medications. The first thing you need to do when you start your shift is locate the care plan. During your orientation, you'll be shown where the care plans are kept. The care plan includes the doctor's orders, and the Medication Administration Record, commonly known as the MAR. This is the time to look at the doctor's orders and the MAR to figure out your medication administration assignments for your shift. The care plan will tell you about how to administer the medication. For example, whether you need to give it with food or drink, whether you need to crush the pills, or other considerations as to how the person likes to take their medications. You may also find instructions about how to administer the medications from the pharmacist directions on the label. For medications administered by feeding tube, you'll be provided with individual training not contained in this video. If you are working in a home that has a medication administration record, check that no one has given the medication already. You will know this because someone else's initial will be in the place where you would sign when you are finished. If this has happened, you will need to contact someone in authority for further direction. Contained on the back of the MAR, there may be a list of caregiver signatures and initials. If there is, make sure you sign this so there is a record of your signature and initial. If your agency has a master record of caregiver signatures and initials, you may not need to do this previous step. Before you begin administering medications, tell your coworkers you're going to be giving meds and you do not want to be disturbed. You should also eliminate distractions before you give medications. Hey guys, I was going to give medications. Can you keep it down a little bit? Most medication errors are human errors resulting from distraction. Tell you what, Brian, I'll come back in half an hour, okay? If things are very hectic, noisy, and demanding, take a minute to regroup your thoughts and focus on the task at hand. If things are too hectic and noisy, move to a quieter place. 
delegate some tasks to your coworkers. Wait until later when things calm down. With most medications, you have one hour before or after the time listed on the MAR to administer them. Although be aware that some medications need to be given at a specific time. The direction for this will be indicated on the MAR and the med container. When you are ready to administer the medication, tell the person that you are caring for that it is time for their medications. Before giving the medications, attend to any needs, such as going to the washroom or positioning them. Before starting to administer the medication, wash your hands. Refer to the hand washing module for proper hand washing techniques. When you are ready, clear an area and assemble what you need. For example, med cups, food or drink, or a pill crusher. You will find this information in the care plan. Once you have your equipment assembled, open the med cupboard and get out the proper medication. From the time you open the medication cupboard, you will be looking for eight things to ensure accuracy. These are known as the eight rights. The right client, the right medication, the right dose, the right route, the right time, and for PRN as needed meds, add the right reason, and afterwards the right documentation, and at all times use the right attitude. Once you have determined you have the correct medication, bring it over to the MAR and hold the labels as close as practical to each other and check the rights again for a second time. When you have determined that everything matches up, examine the blister pack or pouch for any signs of damage or indications that it has been tampered with. If the blister pack looks okay, open the desired med and put it into a med cup without touching the medication. The blister pack may be labeled with dates, in which case you will have matched up the correct blister to the correct date. All blister packs have numbers, and some facilities match the number to the correct date. If your place of work uses the pouch pack system, a pouch pack has the first four rights printed on the package. Right person, right med, right dose, and right time. You will be shown this during your orientation. If you make a mistake and the med accidentally drops on the floor or the particular blister that you are using is damaged, note it in the appropriate documentation used to your site and obtain another med from the approved source. The contaminated med should be returned to the pharmacy for disposal. Once you have dispensed a medication, indicate this on the MAR by putting a dot in the medication's initial space. If by accident you do not sign for the med, the next shift will at least know it was dispensed. Before you put the blister pack or bottle away, check it a third time to make sure you've done everything correctly. Then put the blister pack in the med cabinet and lock it up. Do not leave the meds unattended. If you have to stop administering medications for any reason, make sure they are labeled and locked in the med cupboard. Please note that if you do not sign for the medications, you will be disciplined as per your agency's error policy. Properly position the person for taking meds. Many persons support are dysphagic, that is trouble swallowing and eating, and positioning can be very important. This information will be in the person's book or care plan. Take into consideration the person's safety and comfort. Some things to remember. Keep your hands in the work area. Do not touch hair, nose, mouth, or other dirty areas. If you contact something you have doubts about, for example you have to help the person blow their nose, Wash your hands again. If the person says they don't want to take their meds or refuses to take them in other ways, for example, keeping their mouth closed or spitting them out later, speak to a person in authority and try to find out the reason why the person is not taking the medication. It is important to note whether this is the first time this has happened or if this is a regular occurrence, in which case there will be protocols to deal with this situation. Give the meds according to the information in the care plan. If you have questions or are unclear about something, verify the information with a person in authority before you give the meds. Make sure the medications are taken. 
ask the person if the medication has gone down, or in the case of nonverbal people, or where there is a question of non-compliance, look in the person's mouth to verify that the medication has been taken. If the person spits out the med or vomits after taking the med, contact a person in authority, as frontline staff do not have the authority to make a decision on the next course of action. Initial the MAR. This is an important step that cannot be overlooked and is considered a med error if ignored. Many staff keep a personal list of medications they have administered during their shift and take five minutes at the end of the shift to make sure it is recorded. This is a double check only. Do not wait until the end of the day to sign the MAR. If you're working with another staff, act as a backup for each other and check each other's work. If you ever make a mistake in documentation on the MAR, stroke a single line through the error and make the correction. Never use whiteout or scratch out a documentation error. Complete the PRN information on the back of the MAR if applicable. An important step in PRN medication documentation is to go back and check for effect an hour after administering the medication and record the result. This is information that the doctor uses to make future decisions. Make sure it is not ignored. You should know when and why you are giving a PRN medication and have a protocol as to when to give the medication. For a person registered with Health Services for Community Living, a health care plan will provide clear direction on administering a PRN medication and an HSCL nurse will provide task 2 training on how and when to give a PRN medication. If you are unsure as to whether to give a PRN medication, wait and confirm the information with a person in authority before giving it. If information is needed on a particular drug, for example generic versus trade names, and there is no information on site, information could be obtained from a pharmacist. Save on Foods and some Shoppers Drug Mart locations are open until midnight. When administering a topical medication, do all your checks at the med station, then put on a glove and transfer an appropriate amount of the topical med to a med cup to take to the person's room. This is used as a method to avoid staff contacting the medication and to avoid cross-contamination. Details as to the amount of medication and where to apply it will be located in the person's topical medication protocol. When administering liquid medications, make sure you note the marking on the cup for the appropriate amount and view the cup from a level surface. If you accidentally pour too much into the med cup, discard the excess. Do not return it to the medication container. Medications are a serious business. Hence, we need to ensure all people are familiar with handling difficult situations and the procedures involved. Many times, questions can be answered reviewing the person's information on the medication administration record. However, situations can arise where you will need to contact a person in authority. In all cases, where it becomes necessary to contact someone for help during the night or when a person in authority is unavailable, a backup system should be clearly defined for you. It is important to know what constitutes a medication error. Medication errors include, but are not limited to, the following. Omission of a medication for longer than one hour. Administration of the wrong medication. Administration of the wrong dosage of medication. Administration of medication at the wrong time. Administration of medication to the wrong individual. Administration of medication via the wrong route. Medication given without an order. Medication given for the wrong reason. Failure to document administration of medication. Failure to document PRNs given on front and back of the medication administration record and in progress notes. 
medical protocols identified in the health care plan not followed, failure to complete required medication check. The most important action to be taken after a medication error has occurred is to ensure the health and safety of the person or persons involved. The administration of medication is a serious issue. In any situation, medication errors must be documented and employers must set in place protocols for review and additional training if required. The safe dispensing of medications are a condition of continued employment. Good afternoon, folks. I'm really glad to see you. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to uh, talk to you about medications and drugs in adults in care. It's, um, I really want to welcome you here. I think it's a great opportunity to, to discuss and to um, learn more about medication. Uh, do you have any questions? So Dr. Plain, what are the most common reasons for medications? Basically, the type of medication we use for acute conditions would be antibiotics. The same sort of medication we use for pneumonias or upper respiratory infections or urinary tract. Those medications we'd use to stabilize conditions uh, or to treat a chronic condition might be medications for stomach, uh, particularly anticonvulsants, anti-diabetic medications, anti-inflammatories. Why is it that people with developmental disabilities seem to take more medications than other people? I know that people with uh, developmental disabilities seem to be taking an awful lot of medication. And in fact, that really is true. We have to remember that people with a developmental disability often have significant health issues that go along with that disability. A good example would be cerebral palsy, where people have problems with swallowing, they have problems with mobility, they have problems with arthritis, they have problems with chronic pain, and these often come on at a fairly young age. So the need to treat those individual disabilities or those individual conditions uh, requires different medication. So yes, indeed, people with disabilities take a lot of medication, but each one of them is specific to a, to a certain condition that they have. They're called comorbidities. Um, there are some people with disabilities who take no medications, as you're well aware. Dr. Plain, could you please discuss what are the most common categories of medications used? So the, the most common categories of medications that we use are antibiotics, which we've already discussed, anticonvulsants, tranquilizers, and those break down into both major and minor categories, antidepressants, GI motility modifiers. And the, the real name for that is an anti-reflux agent. I think that's what most people are, are familiar with. Pain medications, of course medications for diabetes, medications for heart, and medications for asthma or chronic lung conditions. As a support worker, what is it that I need to know and document when I'm administering medications? When administering drugs as a caregiver to a person in your care, it's really important to remember the rules, the golden rules of right the right drug, the right dose, the right time, the right person, and the right method of administration. By doing that, you'll be able to protect the safety of the vulnerable individual in your care. And clear and legible documentation of administration, ensuring that the medication is actually taken as prescribed and actually taken by the individual and not pocketed or sequestered in their mouth, and lastly, recording and discussing any abnormalities you notice in the way in which the person takes the medication or any unusual reactions to the medication the person might have. Are medications ever used for any other reason than their primary purpose? That's a really good question, and I get asked that one quite frequently. The short answer is yes, but I need to elaborate. Medications are prescribed for a specific health condition. 
And the best example I can think of is epilepsy. And so for a person who has a seizure disorder, they get an anti-epileptic drug or a variety of anti-epileptic drugs. But if you take a look at many of the people we support, they will be on anti-epileptic drugs and we know from their history they don't have epilepsy. So why are they taking these drugs? Research has shown that some drugs, particularly the anti-epileptic drugs, have beneficial effects in people with certain psychiatric illnesses, such as bipolar disorder. And so you'll find a person who has a bipolar disorder, the old term being manic depressive condition, you'll find these people being stabilized on anticonvulsant medications when they don't have epilepsy. So that's why you sometimes see people using medications for non-indicated purposes. If you look at the literature, you won't find that drug being used for that particular purpose. But in reality, experimental and practical sides of medicine will show that they do have a beneficial and therapeutic effect. So that's why you see them used. Dr. Plain, can I give someone a complementary or alternative medication? Well, complementary and alternative therapies may indeed be used uh, for people with a developmental disability, but they are dealt with in a somewhat different fashion and they need to be authorized or prescribed by a person licensed under the BC Health Professions Act. So these medications, complementary and alternative medications or CAMS, C-A-M-S, can be used only if prescribed by a person who's licensed under the Health Professions Act. They're not covered under Pharmacare. They've got to be purchased by the family and taken to a licensed pharmacist. That pharmacist will make sure that there's no contraindication to their use with existing medications because some of them can raise the effect of a medication or lower the effect of a conventional medication. The pharmacist also has to receive authorization from the attending physician or from the health professional and must include these medications in the blister pack or bliss pack. The uh, meds then get listed on the medication administration record and their administration is recorded as with any other medication and subject to review by the uh, pharmacist. Dr. Plain, what happens if a family member should bring vitamins in? I think we've addressed that issue to a certain extent in the, in the previous question. Families have the right to bring medication in. However, they need to pay for it. They need to take it to the pharmacist. The physician needs to approve it. It needs to be bliss packed, put in the blister pack, and the medication needs to be included on the medication administration record. That way you as a caregiver or a person providing that medication to the individual has the form and it's all part of the legal process. Certainly within community living, the, the need for documentation and signing for medications is terribly important. So yes, families do have the right to bring medication in, but it still has to go through an accepted process that ensures the safety and compatibility of the medication with other drugs. Hello, I'm Carla Kane, Practice Consultant, Community Care Facilities Licensing, Vancouver Island Health Authority. The Community Care and Assisted Living Act and Adult Care Regulations lay out the requirements for people operating residential care homes that house three or more people requiring care and or supervision. Section 8.1 of the Adult Care Regulations states, a licensee must appoint a supervising pharmacist to serve on the Medication Safety and Advisory Committee and provide consultation to staff members regarding medication-related problems and interactions. 8.4 bracket 2, only staff members administer medications. They must make appropriate arrangements for the administration of medications if a person is going out for the day, and these must be outlined in policy and procedures set out by the Medication Safety and Advisory Committee. 8.8, .8, 
a licensee must ensure that a person's medication is returned to the dispensing pharmacy when the person is no longer taking the medication or the expiry date on the medication has passed. Medication errors that must be reported to licensing are errors in the administration of a medication that adversely affect a person in care or require emergency intervention or transfer to a hospital. Incident report forms are provided by licensing staff for this purpose to each home. Based on the information in the incident report, the licensing officer determines if an investigation is necessary and the level of investigation required. The regulations related to medication administration demonstrate one area where licensing provides an important safeguard for people living in group homes. Hi, my name is Bob Mayer. I'm a pharmacist, and I would like to talk about the role of a pharmacist in a residential care facility and a group home. A pharmacist providing services to a residential care facility and a group home must be a member of the facility's medication safety and advisory committee. A pharmacist must advise in the development of the policies and procedures for safe and effective distribution, administration, and control of medications within the residential care facility or home. Reporting medication incidents and monitoring therapeutic outcomes and reporting adverse drug reactions. A pharmacy providing services to a residential care facility and a group home must have a documented ongoing quality management program that monitors the pharmacy services provided. This program must include the process for reporting and documentation of medication incidents, discrepancies, and the follow-up. There is mainly two medication packaging systems, blister cards and a strip or pouch packaging. Let's first take a look at the blister cards. This is a one drug per blister, 35-day card. This is a system commonly used, especially in the larger facilities. An advantage of this packaging is that staffing at both pharmacy and facility can be more effectively scheduled. As 35 is a multiple of seven, the card exchange is always done on the same day of the week. It's also a cost-saving measure as there are fewer exchanges in a year. The next type of the blister card is one drug per blister, monthly supply. This system is sometimes used in a smaller facilities or group homes when there is no RNs or LPNs on the staff and the facility manager feels that it is an easier system for the staff to follow. Blister number one is used on the first day of the month. Blister number two on the second day of the month and so on. An advantage of this system is that the blister number corresponds to the day of the month. A possible disadvantage of this system is that the computer entry for the quantity dispensed has to be changed depending on the number of days in the month. Now let's have a look at the strip or pouch packaging systems. There are machines which automate packaging of the medications. Medication dispensing machines dispense medications either in a unit dose strip or multi-drug packets. We'll be only reviewing the multi-drug strip packaging as the unit dose strip packaging is not used in our facility. With multi-drug strip packaging, each pouch in the strip contains up to generally four medications. If more medications are to be administered for a particular medication time, the machine automatically packages the others in the next pouch. Each pouch in this system is required to be labeled with the full information as stated in the professional practice policy. Medication packages are exchanged between the pharmacy and the facility every seven days. For safety reasons, neither facility staff or pharmacy staff is permitted to remove what they have identified as changed or discontinued medication. 
If a drug is discontinued or directions are changed, the pharmacy sends a new medication strip for the remaining days and the old strip is returned to the pharmacy for proper disposal. The reason multi-drug pouch packaging is done in seven-day intervals is to prevent waste of changed or discontinued medication. Hello, I'm Pam Cannon, and I'm here to explain my role in the community living setting as an HSCL nurse. HSCL stands for Health Services for Community Living. So what is the role of the HSCL nurse? To give medication information and liaise with the community pharmacist, assess methods of dispensing medications, Assist the nurse and the group home manager with implementing PRN medication procedures. To teach, sign off, and monitor caregivers for PRN medications in non-nurse group homes in accordance with Section 2 delegation procedures. Assist with routes of medication administration. Example, intramuscular, or subcutaneous. To teach and monitor diabetes stabilization and to monitor compliance and safety. So when can a client be referred to HSCL? A client can be referred to home nursing care for the following. Diabetes stabilization, palliative care and support, seizure management, bowel management, and any complex tasks that require ongoing training and monitoring by healthcare professionals. Nursing backup is available for staff members. Generally, nursing backup is available for on-care clients only. Home nursing care is available during day and evening. There is an on-call night RN for identified significant health issues, such as G-tube management. Any undiagnosed problems need to be referred to the person's physician. Now let's talk about Task 2 training. Task 2 or Section 2 tasks are professional tasks that are delegated to a staff member providing care in the home. So why is it done? Delegating tasks to unregulated care providers. Delegating to an unregulated care provider occurs when the required task is performed primarily by registered nurses and is outside the role, description and training of the unregulated care provider. The delegated task is always client specific and the delegation is determined to be in that client's best interest. Client-specific means that the unregulated care provider must not perform the delegated task with another client unless it is also delegated to the unregulated care provider by a registered nurse. All Section 2 tasks require an established individualized health care plan and must be established by the appropriate health care professions in consultation with the physician, the person, the group home manager or supervisor, caregivers and family advocates. An example of a task to delegate a task would be any prescription, PRN medication. I think it would be helpful now to review the role of the community support worker. Community support workers can administer routine prescription and non-prescription medications. From a blister pack or dosette, on a regular basis for reasons of a routine nature, using the medication administration record, MAR. When the client response to the medication is predictable, when the client status is stable. Assignment, Section 1 tasks, PRN medications, over-the-counter or non-prescription. 
Many clients require non-prescription PRN medications for common periodic elements such as colds, influenza, headaches, or constipation. Example, analgesics, antitussives, decongestants are non-prescription over-the-counter. The HSCL community nurse may decide to organize the medication administration procedure with a protocol. For instance, an antitussive may be administered according to a client-specific protocol the nurse has written. In this circumstance, it is not necessary for the nurse to teach and sign off each community support worker about each of these medications. Instead, the community support worker will use the protocol to guide him or her when it is time to administer these types of medications. Delegation, Section 2 Tasks, PRN Medications, Prescription. In a group home setting or family model home, staff providing care can complete this task after delegation training by a registered nurse. PRN medications will only be given according to direction on the pharmacy supplied MAR and according to an established health care plan and a client specific protocol. The efficacy of the PRN prescription medication will be reviewed at the annual health care planning meeting or sooner if necessary. At all times when making the decision to delegate a task, the nurse will consider the following. Client factors, task factors, care environment factors, and staff providing care. Community support workers sometimes ask if they are required to follow the health care plan, even if they disagree with the plan. Per licensing, you are required to follow the health care plan, even if you disagree. Generally, we meet yearly to review a health care plan and do changes. Working in the best interest of the client as an RN, I follow professional standards of care and utilize scope of practice per the College of Registered Nurses of BC. You have now seen the correct method of medication administration. You have seen how this process is a result of teamwork, from the frontline worker, to the group home manager, the community nurse, the pharmacist, and the physician. The correct administration of medication is not just good practice, it is a requirement by law under the Community Care Facilities Act and enforced by licensing officers in licensed facilities. Before the end of this presentation, let's review the most important steps when administering medications, known as the rights of medication administration. Make sure you have the right person, the right medication, Make sure you have the right dose of medication. Administer the medication via the right route, at the right time. Be sure you are giving the medication for the right reason. Afterwards, provide the right documentation. And always use the right attitude, treating this important procedure with care and attention. Blister Pack, a medication dosage system in which medications are packaged into individual bubbles for specific dosage times. CLCA, Community Living Contractors Association. Dispensing Times, OD, once daily, BID, twice daily, TID, three times daily, QID, four times daily, HS, at bedtime. HSCL, Health Services for Community Living. MAR, Medication Administration Record, a profile of the person's medication issued monthly by the pharmacy. Medication Order Review or Medication Review, a form with physician's orders which is a current ongoing record of orders, 
reviewed at six months minimum with a pharmacist. Pack Med System, a computer-generated medication dosage system in which medications are packaged into clear plastic pouches for specific dosage times. Pouches may contain multiple medications, which are listed on each pouch. PRN, Proranata, medications that are given as needed.